Good morning. Uh, my name is Mark Bailey. I'm the chair of the United States Studies Centre at the University of Sydney. And on behalf of the board of the United States Studies Centre, thank you for joining us today for this special event, Resilience, Relationship and Rules, Australian Foreign Policy in an Uncertain World, which is held on the eve of the 70th anniversary of the date the ANZUS Treaty took effect, 29th of April, 1952. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia. The University of Sydney stands on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I further acknowledge the, the traditional owners of the country on which you are on and pay respects to their Elders past, present and future. I would also like to acknowledge we are delighted to be joined in person today by the recently arrived US Consul General, Christine Elder. The US Studies Centre exists to provide evidence-based research into the foreign policy discussion. We also work to convene leaders in the field to share ideas, debate and help shape the strategic direction for foreign policy as it relates to Australia, the United States and the region. To today's event is timely and we wanted to take this, the opportunity to host a discussion at this critical juncture. There is clear evidence that geostrategic, political and economic tensions are increasing around the, the globe. Recent developments in our own part of the world, the Indo-Pacific, as a theatre for great power competition, has provided a case in point. The war in Ukraine only reinforces this, this view. The democratic, rules-based order in place since the early 20th century has provided a powerful framework which has delivered peace and prosperity to many of the world's population and allowed the tragedy of major power conflict to be avoided over the past 80 years. In our own country, the ANZUS Treaty and our alliance with America has been one of the foundation stones upon which Australia's own peace and prosperity has been built. So it was appropriate that we commemorated and celebrated the 70th anniversary of its signing at our recent Alliance dinner, Alliance at 70 dinner in Canberra. It is against this background and within this context, we are delighted to welcome Australia's Foreign Minister, Maurice Payne, who will speak on Australia's foreign policy in an uncertain world. In the spirit of bipartisanship, I also note that we have extended an invitation to Shadow, Minister, uh, Shadow Foreign Affairs Minister, Penny Wong, who has also spoken at our events recently. We would be very pleased to host her at a future event. After the Minister's remarks, we will host a moderated Q&A to tackle key questions on the policy. Because the majority of our guests, guests today are joining us online, we invite you to share your questions in the question box on your Zoom screen. Finally, we will have some concluding remarks from Kirsten Andrews on behalf of the University of Sydney's Vice-Chancellor, Mark Scott. Kirsten is the University's Vice Principal, External Relations, and also a recently appointed USSC board member. I would now like to hand over to Dr. Mike Green, Senior Vice President for Asia, Japan Chair at the Centre for Strategic and International Studies. As many of you will know, we have recently announced Mike's appointment as the next CEO of the US Studies Centre, and we are very pleased he can join us today from Washington, DC. Welcome, Mike. you today, tonight for me from Washington as a, as a guest of the center. And I look forward to moving to Sydney with my family soon and, and, and taking on the responsibilities of CEO. Um, Senator the Honorable Maurice Payne, uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs and Minister for Women, and the first woman to serve as Defense Minister, has had all of these key posts during one of the most consequential moments in Australian foreign and defense policy in, in a generation at least. The uncertainty that this region faces with the Chinese agreement on security with the Solomons, uh, the brutal Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, have thrown into question the future of this region and indeed of global order. And all of these developments have highlighted the centrality of our alliance to regional and to global stability uh, and the importance to the United States of Australian initiative and leadership uh, in the Indo-Pacific. So with that as context, it is a particular privilege for me to introduce our speaker, uh, to hear her views on resilience, relationships, and rules, Australian foreign policy in an uncertain world. 
Well, thank you very much and welcome to Minister Payne. Thank you very much uh, to uh, Dr. Mike Green for your very warm introduction and of course my congratulations on your appointment as CEO of this very prestigious institution. It was great to see you in Canberra uh, at the Alliance 70th anniversary dinner uh, and we certainly look forward to welcoming you to Sydney in due course. Uh, to the chair of the US Studies Centre, Mark Bailey, uh, and members of the centre's board, as uh, well as Edward Parmesano, the whole team at the US Studies Centre, thank you very much for hosting me here today. I also acknowledge the other distinguished guests, both here and online, uh, and uh, including our new US Consul General in Sydney, Christine Elder, uh, and Kirsten Andrews from the University of Sydney. Let me acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which we are all meeting and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Ladies and gentlemen, as Mark Bailey said, tomorrow, the 29th of April, marks exactly 70 years since the ANZUS Treaty came into force. The text of the treaty affirmed our shared desire to strengthen the fabric of peace in the Pacific. It also declared that no potential aggressor could be under the illusion that any of us as signatories stood alone in the Pacific. For 70 years, Australia has known that we are far more secure because we do not stand alone. This knowledge has given us confidence and assisted in enabling us to flourish and prosper there's nothing quite like having good friends and trusted partners. Over these same seven decades, the world has seen extraordinary economic growth and stability, nowhere more than in the Indo-Pacific. These two things are not coincidental. The values and principles that bind Australia and the United States and which we share with many other partners, both in the Indo-Pacific and beyond, promote stability and prosperity, not just for ourselves, but for all. The Australian people, the American people, share much in our cherishing of national and individual freedom and fairness, of openness and optimism. We believe in democracy. We believe in free speech, human rights and equality. We believe in the rule of law and a set of rules that creates a level playing field enabling healthy competition between open economies. Our alliance spans diplomacy, trade, intelligence, shared facilities, security and defence, space and cyber, and ties between our people, our cultures and our outlook. It's an essential element in keeping Australians safe, which is the first priority of any Australian government. Importantly, our alliance has and will continue to evolve as our strategic circumstances change. And they are changing. We've entered a period that is becoming more dangerous, less stable and less prosperous. Australia has been at the forefront of addressing this geostrategic reality in our region. The Morrison government's approach is founded in a firm belief that we have agency and influence to shape our strategic environment for the better. We've done so with a strong voice, with sound principles and policies at home and abroad, and through practical measures with our partners to invigorate the relationships that provide stability and confidence. Australia has a track record as one of the countries that has been clearest and most consistent in response to the changing circumstances, particularly China's growing assertiveness in the Indo-Pacific. We have led on this. There is now strong agreement from amongst the Australian people that standing firm on our values and principles, even in the face of pressure, is the right approach for our long-term future. Building our strength and working with others to put that strength to good use is our safest course to ensuring that in the coming decades we are free to be ourselves and to exercise our choices. As the Prime Minister said, 
just earlier this week on Anzac Day. The world is changing before our eyes. War stalks Europe again. Coercion troubles our own region once more, and an arc of autocracy from Beijing to Moscow is challenging the rules-based world order. We are seeing authoritarian regimes clearly take this as the time to increase oppression internally and coerce others internationally. We see some large countries preying upon smaller countries. We see coercion, disinformation, cyber attacks. COVID-19 has also exacerbated many of the challenges we face. We see increased economic uncertainty and deepened risks of recession and of protectionism. The pandemic has fueled dangerous disinformation. Climate change presents additional challenges for our region, along with transnational crime and, of course, the persistent threat of terrorism. Russia's invasion of Ukraine is a salutary reminder of the consequences of lawlessness and major power aggression unconstrained by rules. It's an important lesson for the Indo-Pacific, including the fact that international stability can easily be disrupted. The response must be to ensure that we compete effectively to advance the kind of region in which we want to live. That's a region in which international laws are observed, trade is free and open, security is assured, and each country's sovereignty is respected and the same rules apply to all, regardless of size. We have agency to engage and to shape the region to secure these interests and uphold our values. And it's clear to us, if we don't shape our environment, it will shape us and not for the better. We lose agency, we lose options. The Australian government has a clear and focused plan based around three principles, resilience, relationship and rules. That means resilience over reliance, relationships over vulnerable isolation and rules over anarchy. Australia must be strong and sovereign with a growing and resilient economy. That's what we're working to protect and advance. First, at home, we've made tough decisions to protect our democracy, to protect our systems, and importantly, to defend our values. The government over the past several years has taken important steps to protect ourselves and our people and to enable us to compete more effectively. These include our laws to counter foreign interference and espionage, a world leading decision to exclude vendors from our 5G network who posed national security risks, a strengthened foreign investment regime, laws I introduced to ensure consistency in our foreign policy, Magnitsky sanctions reforms to target those who perpetrate serious human rights abuses, corruption and malicious cyber activity, laws to make our critical infrastructure more secure, including from cyber threats. Secondly, we are amongst the strongest proponents of free and open trade, based on international rules to ensure fairness, because trade is vital to Australia's economy. We've seen authoritarian countries use economic leverage to coerce, to enforce silence, or to undermine the sovereignty and interests of others. We are therefore strengthening our resilience against such measures by supporting robust international rules, encouraging the diversification of Australia's trade and securing supply chains. We're a founding member of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. We signed our historic economic cooperation and trade agreement with India earlier this month and the Australia-UK free trade agreement in December last year. We're working with partners on supply chain resilience, including through the Quad, the G20, APEC, and the G7 Plus. And we've established the $107 million supply chain resilience initiative to establish or scale manufacturing capabilities or address supply chain vulnerabilities in critical areas like semiconductors, agricultural chemicals, telecommunications equipment, and personal protective equipment. 
Thirdly, we're building the resilience of our region because a stable neighbourhood benefits our own economy and a safe neighbourhood is a good place to live. From vaccines to infrastructure, from cyber to low emission technology and investments in economic resilience, we're working with partners to deliver practical and positive benefits, particularly as countries continue to face the economic impacts of COVID-19. On vaccines, for example, Australia has so far delivered over 30 million doses to partners in the Indo-Pacific of the 60 million we have committed. Further deliveries continue into the region literally this week. We deliver on our promises transparently. Fourthly, over the past eight years, Australia has been undertaking the most comprehensive expansion of our defence capability in our lifetimes. We've increased the defence budget to over 2% of GDP this year. The United States is a critical partner for us in this endeavour, sharing technologies and expertise to develop the most advanced capabilities to defend our nation, including through the AUKUS partnership. This range of initiatives strengthens our sovereignty and makes us a more capable partner in maintaining a region in which all nations can pursue their interests and values free from coercion, intimidation or pressure. Australia is amongst a group of nations championing democratic values. However, we clearly also have aligned interests with countries that have different political systems. Amongst those aligned interests is a balanced region in which no one country dominates and in which all states' rights and sovereignty are respected. Australia stands for a freer, more open, more inclusive world. A region in which an authoritarian power is dominant doesn't get us closer to that goal. And that's why the resilience of all states is essential. The strategic challenges that Australia and our immediate neighbours face are by no means unique. In my discussions with global counterparts from the Pacific to Southeast Asia to Europe, it's clear that as authoritarian powers assert themselves, smaller and vulnerable states are facing comparable stresses and dangers wherever they are. We respond to these challenges more effectively with partners. No one nation alone can manage the array of challenges that we face. We are most certainly stronger together. As Australia's Foreign Minister, I've regularly engaged close counterparts on these sensitive and complex challenges in our immediate region, including in recent weeks, those from Europe, around the table at NATO, from India, Indonesia, Japan, the UK, the US, Republic of Korea, Canada, across the Pacific, the Solomon Islands, New Zealand, Samoa, Tuvalu, Tonga, Nauru and the Cook Islands. By working with partners across the globe, not just in the Indo-Pacific, we're continuing our deliberate development of a strong network of complementary partnerships. We were the first country to secure a comprehensive strategic partnership with ASEAN last year reflecting the importance of ASEAN, which sits at the heart of our approach to the Indo-Pacific. We agreed comprehensive strategic partnerships with India, with Malaysia, with the Republic of Korea in the last two years, and our comprehensive strategic and economic partnership with Papua New Guinea, and our Vivale partnership with family and friends in Fiji. We are strengthening further our critical partnership with Indonesia, including with President Widodo's visit to Australia and the entry into, the, into force of the Indonesia-Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement in 2020. We have taken the Quad from an idea that was effectively shelved, shelved by previous governments to a leading grouping of democracies who are now meeting at least once a year at leader level and at foreign minister level. Most recently at foreign minister level, uh, in our Quad Foreign Ministers meeting held in Australia, in Melbourne, in February. We're taking practical action to meet challenges like COVID vaccination, cyber attacks, disinformation and infrastructure development. In fact, the progress made by Australia, India, Japan and the United States in the Quad 
in aligning our efforts to multiply impact will continue to yield benefits to the region for decades to come. And there is our landmark agreement, AUKUS, which will enhance our national security for decades. In addition to nuclear-powered submarines, AUKUS enables us to share advanced technology, including on cyber, on quantum technology, on artificial intelligence, on undersea capabilities, on hypersonics and electronic warfare. As we advance the AUKUS partnership, Australia is strongly committed to upholding our non-proliferation obligations and commitments and strengthening the non-proliferation regime. Our non-proliferation credentials are world leading and we will maintain the highest standards. We're also partnering with our Pacific family in a wide variety of ways to help them preserve and strengthen their sovereignty and improve the lives of people across our region. We've been expanding and deepening our partnerships through the Pacific Step Up, through our expanded diplomatic footprint, our targeted and effective development program, and our whole of government efforts delivered through the Office of the Pacific. We have made record investments in the Pacific, $1.85 billion in development assistance in this coming year, and $2.7 billion in total support for the Pacific for the current year, including our, not just our development assistance, but our security, health and financial support. We have responded to our Pacific family in times of need, whether through the economic and health shocks of the COVID-19 pandemic, whether it's responding to natural disasters such as Tonga's volcanic eruption and tsunami, or responding to the Solomon Islands' call for assistance to civil unrest in late last year. We have invested in Pacific economies We've increased our Pacific climate finance commitment to at least $700 million. We've doubled the lending capacity of the Australia Infrastructure Financing Facility for the Pacific from $1.5 billion to $3 billion in this last budget to provide further options for Pacific countries on infrastructure, options that are climate adapted and climate resilient, focused on their priorities and their plans and also creating Pacific labour mobility programs that have enabled more than 19,400 workers to arrive in Australia since our borders reopened. We've strengthened our security partnerships. We've delivered 14, so far, out of the 21 pledged Guardian-class patrol boats and upgraded wharf infrastructure in Papua New Guinea, in Tuvalu, in Tonga, in Samoa, in the Solomon Islands, in Fiji, in Palau, in Kiribati, in Vanuatu, and the Federated States of Micronesia. We are delivering regional security institutions, including the recently opened Black Rock Peacekeeping and Humanitarian Assistance and Disaster Relief Camp in Fiji. I was present for the sod turn of the Black Rock Camp. To see it completed and operational is a landmark achievement between Australia and Fiji, not just for Fiji, but for our region. We're working to deliver Lombrum Naval Base in Papua New Guinea and a border and patrol boat outposts in Solomon Islands. We have established the Pacific Fusion Centre in Vanuatu and delivering training and analysis on security issues with our Pacific partners, in their, with, their, with their analysts in Port Vila. And most importantly, We've invested heavily in our people-to-people -people links, despite the challenges of COVID-19 travel restrictions, which have been significant. Since 2018, Australia has opened six new diplomatic posts. We are now the only country with a diplomatic mission in every Pacific Island Forum member country. Today, in Honiara, our High Commissioner will attend an event for the handover of 150,930 doses of Pfizer vaccine through an agreement with UNICEF. This brings to more than half a million the number of doses we have delivered to the Solomon Islands. And we have seen great support through OSMAT teams, uh, through the support of the ADF for the delivery of that COVID-19 support and health security across the wide and dispersed Solomon Islands. We will continue talking with the Solomon Islands government in Honiara. But I have noted, and I reiterate, that we are deeply concerned by the Solomon Islands signing of the security agreement last week with China. 
Of course, I have consistently acknowledged that this is a clear sovereign decision of a sovereign government. However, we know other members of the Pacific family share our concerns. As I said, we'll continue talking with the Solomon Islands government about how the Pacific family is best placed to provide security assistance in our region. We have done that successfully. We will continue to do that. And no document signed and kept away from public view is going to change that. We have a bilateral security treaty that is available for anyone to read. That's the way we operate in our partnership with the Solomon Islands and across the Pacific. That's the kind of partner we are. And that is why we're the partner of choice for so many. We have again proven that in response to Solomon Islands unrest late last year, in response to the Tonga volcanic eruption and tsunami in January. We have proven it over 14 years of the regional assistance mission to the Solomon Islands. But we do need to be clear. The Solomon Islands sovereign decision reflects the geostrategic reality of the time we are now in, as China continues to seek a security presence in the Pacific. These are matters we have been dealing with for some time. It's an issue we as a region and a family are facing as other parts of the Indo-Pacific are facing it. We'll continue talking with our Pacific Island Forum partner members on a Pacific Island Forum response. But Australia will always take the necessary appropriate actions to maintain the peace, security and resilience of our region. International laws, rules and norms guide healthy competition and they ensure that competition doesn't lead to conflict or instability. However, intense strategic competition, the global pandemic and resulting economic shocks have exposed weaknesses and stress points in major multilateral institutions and indeed the systems of rules that they administer. Authoritarian states want the current international system to be disrupted, dismantled, reshaped even to serve their own interests. Australia's involvement is therefore vital. We've been at the forefront of articulating this challenge and responding with our own investments to ensure our influence works to build transparency and accountability. Through recent UN votes, the world has sent a signal to authoritarian nations by emphatically repudiating Russia's wholesale breach of the UN Charter and international law through its illegal invasion of Ukraine. Australia joined partners in referring the situation to the International Criminal Court in early March because President Putin and his regime must face consequences for their, their and his unprovoked war. We've all seen the disturbing evidence of war crimes and the potential evidence of genocide. We have offered, as, uh, from Australia, two officers to the International Criminal Court, and we're looking to provide further Australian Federal Police investigative support, particularly given our experience as part of the joint investigative team on the downing of MH17. Today, I can also announce a further $1 million in voluntary contributions to assist the International Criminal Court's investigations. This is in addition to our annual contributions. The appalling crimes committed over the past two months demonstrate why these international institutions and processes matter more than ever. Australia will promote rules-based economic integration and advocate against protectionism. We're working with like-minded partners to strengthen institutions like the World Trade Organization to defend the rights of all economies to trade free from coercion. Internet, international institutions are not perfect, They've never been so, but they are indispensable as the fora through which we can generate collective action against countries that unilaterally undermine stability or coerce others. Ladies and gentlemen, these three principles of strengthening resilience, relationships and rules will continue to be vital as we act to shape our region. The pace at which China has sought to exercise influence and raw power in the Indo-Pacific has been rapid, more so than many were predicting only a decade ago. 
Australia has been at the forefront of global efforts to respond to the implications of this shift in power. We have been candid and forthright with partners. We have spoken with conviction and consistency in defence of our national interests. We have been acting to make Australia and our region more secure, delivering vaccines and reinforcing health security, forging trade rules, seeking leadership in multilateral institutions, providing humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, defending international law and calling for transparency in relation to China's security agenda. We are focused on shaping a stable future for our region in the face of negative and concerning trends. None can be in doubt as to what Australia stands for. Strategic competition and supply chain issues exacerbated by the pandemic have demonstrated beyond question that any separation between strategic and economic interests does not serve Australia's interests. When I addressed the US Study Centre in October 2019, just months before the COVID-19 pandemic inflicted such damage to our region, I said then that Australians are very interested and alert to the extent to which our circumstances are changing. Now, two and a half years later, these words continue to ring true. We are in the midst of the most significant and consequential realignment of our region since the Second World War, and Australians rightly take a strong interest in these issues. The pandemic and events such as Russia's invasion of Ukraine have reinforced beyond all doubt that the security and prosperity of Australians is tied to our capacity as a, na as a nation to navigate these turbulent times. Our foreign policy is firmly rooted in maintaining the long-term prosperity and security of the Australian people. For that, we have a clear plan. It's a plan that we have been consistently prosecuting, building on our track record of deterring actions contrary to our interests, of mitigating problems when they inevitably arise, and of securing opportunities to advance our prosperity and security. We approach this era of strategic competition with confidence. Confidence in our plan, confidence built on our record, confidence in Australia. From a position of strength, we are competing for the future we want for Australians now and for the generations to come. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Minister, thank you very much indeed. I'm, I'm going to moderate from the other side of the world, if that's all right. Um, I, I have questions in the queue, which I'll get to in a moment, but if I could first, I'd like to pick up on the three R's that formed the core structure of your presentation, and they were compelling, relationships, resilience, and rules. If you read the Biden administration's Indo-Pacific strategy, you'll see that the second of these R's, resilience, uh, features quite prominently. And as somebody who follows these debates in Washington closely, I can tell you that that is um, something that very much reflects your thought leadership and um, DFAT's influence in American strategic thinking. Um, the first, our relationship, uh, you touched on as well. And you noted um, that when allies and partners work together, there's a, a, a it multiplies the impact. Hmm. And you noted that the arc of authoritarianism uh, has risen before our eyes. But there's also a very powerful uh, coalition that has, has emerged very quickly around the values we share as democracies. And um, Australia has stepped up from the Europeans' perspective to deal with the assault on Ukraine, as has Japan and Singapore and other allies and partners in this region. And I think you're seeing from Europe and, of course, North America, increasing interest in the Pacific. So I wanted to ask you first about... Um, uh, what we're seeing now in the Solomon Islands, the increasingly contested sense of the future of this important region in your backyard, and ask about um, other allies and partners. It, you, you, you laid out a very uh, comprehensive um, and um, impactful agenda for Australian foreign policy for the Pacific Island Forum nations. 
I'd be interested in your view of what other allies and partners of Australia can do to help with the step up strategy. The United States, of course, but also Japan, which has major economic and development ties, uh, France, which has the largest EEZ and so forth. Could you could you start by telling us a bit more about um, how you see partnerships and alliances working um, in the Pacific Island Forum nations and the Pacific Islands more broadly um, as part of your strategy? Uh, thank you, Mike, and I think that's a, a really important question because uh, when I say partnerships, uh, I mean uh, across the broad. Uh, we've seen, for example, the EU most recently launch the Global Gateway Program, uh, which is uh, not uh, perhaps focused in traditional areas of activity for the European Union, as we might uh, have historically expected, particularly uh, in uh, in Africa, but certainly has a uh, an Indo-Pacific focus. Uh, I've sat down in, in Brussels with the commissioners, uh, with uh, Uta Aplanen and, uh, and Josep Borrell, to talk about uh, the, the work that is uh, potentially there for this region uh, under the Global Gateway. Uh, we see the, uh, the United Kingdom uh, most recently visiting uh, Australia in January for our AUKMIN consultation, Secretary Truss and, uh, and Secretary Wallace, uh, admittedly prior to uh, the most recent um, uh, actions of Russia in U Ukraine, but taking the opportunity then uh, to uh, to ensure that uh, we were launching an infrastructure program that the UK uh, is interested in pursuing. And of course, uh, they have a, a broad set of diplomatic representation right across the, uh, the Pacific, uh, in particular led here in Australia by High Commissioner uh, Vicky Trudell. I think um, a really timely example and a very challenging one is the work that we have done with France uh, through the France Agreement on Humanitarian Assistance and Disaster Relief. So France, Australia and New Zealand. First responders uh, in many ways uh, for Tonga following that extraordinary volcanic eruption and uh, tsunami uh, which just really uh, was, was so uh, com complex to respond to telecommunications issues, inundation issues, destruction of infrastructure, uh, and so on, and, and a real challenge in getting supplies. Uh, the partnership with France, we actually had French officials embedded in uh, the Joint Operations Command at Bungendor uh, outside Canberra, which you'll come to know uh, soon uh, in Bungendor uh, as part of that response process. I think that goes to um, the, uh, the strength of that, uh, of that trilateral partnership. For Japan, of course, they, uh, they have a, um, a PALM uh, partnership with the Pacific, uh, which meets regularly. They include all the forum foreign ministers uh, in those meetings, uh, and it discusses uh, the issues and works on the issues that are of great Im greatest importance to the Pacific. The agenda is overwhelmingly driven by Pacific countries, and uh, it doesn't shy away from the hard issues. Japan fronts up and engages in those contributions, for example, uh, on the issue of Alps treated water and the release of Fukushima, Fukushima Alps treated water. That's something that we are working on together uh, in the region. The Palm has also seen a really interesting, um, a really interesting uh, opportunity uh, for uh, for those small island nations and particularly atoll states, uh, which are still dealing with the impacts of the Second World War. Uh, not just in terms of unexploded ordnance, but in terms of wrecks, which are now coming to a point of degradation where they are seeping oil into the Pacific. Uh, Japan has been working with uh, with a number of those uh, of those countries. Australia is now working with them as well to ensure that we bring the skills we have to bear. We've done that in the Solomon Islands uh, before, where there was an accident uh, off the Rennell coast uh, in terms of um, of shipping uh, recently too. Um, so there is a broad uh, fabric, if you like, with many threads uh, of these partnerships, and they are only growing. And I think you make a really important point about where Australia and the United States is able to engage more. I can tell you that in Washington, since Kurt Campbell got back in the Congress and think tanks, there's a lot of discussion about what more the US can do and an expectation that Australia is gonna help, help show us the way. Um, I have a lot of questions for you, Minister, not surprisingly about the Solomon Islands um, and the security pact that China's negotiated. Um, and they all have a very similar theme, which I'll summarize and let you answer. And the question basically is, should the government not have seen this coming? Was this an intelligence failure? Um, how would you respond to those um, many questions I've received from, from journalists um, in the queue? 
Uh, thanks, thanks, Mike. And we've made public comment on this in uh, in the last uh, ten days or so. Of course, uh, since um, uh, publicity was uh, was or public uh, profile was given to uh, the issues following um, the material being placed on social media in the Solomon Islands, we've obviously been dealing very closely with the Solomon Islands on security issues consistently for some time, uh, and that includes discussions around um, the desire, as I referred to in my remarks today, for, for, from China, uh, for them to establish a security presence in the region. Uh, and those discussions have been held at the highest levels of government uh, and uh, held uh, amongst uh, both officials, uh, leaders, ministers, uh, senior uh, security officers, particularly the Australian Federal Police uh, and others. And so those conversations enabled us to even more readily deploy the, as part of the Solomon Islands Assistance Force, as we did in November, December of last year, to respond uh, as an urgent priority to the unrest in Honiara that, uh, that uh, occurred at that stage. We did that with New Zealand, with Papua New Guinea and with Fiji, it's important to acknowledge that that is a Pacific family security response that worked, that was immediate, that addressed the needs of the Solomon Islands uh, in, that, uh, in that instance. But this security agreement um, is by uh, the nature of its provisions that we are know of, a secret. It's not transparent, it's not open, Unlike, as I also said in my remarks, uh, Australia's bilateral security treaty with the Solomon Islands. Uh, it is not something that has been uh, made available to partners or discussed with partners, not just not with Australia, but not with Pacific partners as well. And uh, as I also mentioned, we know that there are concerns amongst Pacific partners in relation to that. Because the Pacific has worked very hard over a long time. The Bikitawa Declaration, which stems from 2000, has in its heart references to regional security being handled by the Pacific family. They were amplified and reinforced by the Boy Declaration from Nauru uh, in 2018, uh, which also reinforced the importance of regional responses to security issues that impact uh, the whole region. So whilst we have uh, very close relationships, whilst those relationships enabled us, as I said, to be the first uh, port of call for the Solomon Islands uh, in November, December in response to that unrest, ultimately a security arrangement kept secret uh, at the insistence of a partner uh, is what we are dealing with now. We will continue to work closely with the Solomon Islands. We have been engaging right across the region as well. Uh, and uh, we have been very clear in saying, again, as I said in my remarks, that it is our firm view and the firm view overwhelmingly of, uh, of the majority, if not all, of our Pacific partners, that the Pacific family is best placed to respond first to such security challenges. Now, the Solomon Islands government, at the level of the Prime Minister, has made clear that Australia remains the Solomon Islands security partner of choice. He has said that a number of times, including in their own parliament. He's also explicitly said that the Solomon Islands has no intention uh, that uh, the, uh, treat the security arrangement does not enable the uh, development of a Chinese military base in the Solomon Islands or a persistent military presence. Uh, and we have continued to seek assurances on that and we will be doing so into the future. I can fit in one last very quick question, Minister. Um, as you know, President Biden is traveling to Japan and Korea um, at the end of May, and it's widely expected he will announce the details of the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. And you noted in your remarks that Australia has stood at the forefront of rulemaking and supporting free trade, which is absolutely right. And the United States has done so alongside you until recently, we're, 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 we're falling behind. Um, there's a sense here, at least in the United States, that the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework is a is a, a very thin reed compared to the comprehensive and progressive um, Trans-Pacific Partnership. So I'd be very interested in your in your your vision, your view, your advice for what role the U.S. Uh, can play in rulemaking uh, and, uh, and 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 free trade in this region. 
So, Mike, is that an open invitation to advocate for the US signing of the CPTPP? Uh, and uh, in your current <laughs> role or your future role, I'm not quite sure which, uh, which hat, uh, hat you're wearing. And Australia's consistently advocated for the strength of the CPTPP. That's why we stayed in the processes of the CPTPP when others would have had us leave. Uh, and we are, of course, uh, an inaugural signatory to, uh, to that uh, arrangement. That plus the RCEP, plus our bilateral arrangements, uh, including um, the clumsily named ANSFATAR, our Australia-New Zealand Free Trade Agreement with ASEAN, uh, our bilateral arrangements, a number of which are, I referred to uh, in, in my remarks, our uh, closer economic uh, relationship uh, with New Zealand, the PACER Plus relationships uh, with the Pacific, uh, also a focus on uh, Pacific trade and economic uh, support and growth. These are all essential ingredients of economic presence and economic engagement and drivers uh, in the region which Australia believes are extremely important. Uh, the economic framework, and as you say, uh, the President has, uh, has made an announcement of his uh, visit to uh, Japan in, uh, in late May. That is, uh, I think, uh, an essential step for the United States, but it's not really for me to, uh, to comment on that, uh, but an essential step in our region to make sure that all of those who wish to see this region as one that is open, prosperous, secure and stable, all of those partners are present right across the full panoply of policy areas, but particularly across economic areas. For ASEAN countries uh, who have um, a very strong and clear ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, driven uh, in large part by, uh, by Indonesia and their focus on uh, their place and ASEAN's place in the world. For ASEAN countries, that economic engagement, particularly as they are coming out of COVID-19, is also absolutely essential. We see those economies beset by the impact of COVID-19. We see them struggling with debt burdens that come from a lack of transparency and a lack of, uh, of focus on the priorities of the countries themselves from some donors. That has, that has to be increasing their challenge economically. So the US presence is essential as, uh, as a contributor to that uh, to ensure that, uh, I think, as I also said in my remarks today, that we have those counterbalances and that we have full representation and engagement across the region of as many partners as possible. The most dynamic, the uh, region of greatest growth in the world. If you're not here, you're not anywhere. So that last question was with my CSIS hat on, to be clear, <laughs> but um, uh, polls in the U.S. polls in the U.S. show the highest support for free trade ever among the American public. So please keep after us. Um, thank you, Minister. That was, that I'll was, take that, that invitation terrific. up. Absolutely. Um, uh, just keep after us. We'll, we'll get there. Um, I want to thank you very much uh, and now turn it over to the Vice Principal for External Relations at the University of Kirsten Andrews for a closing appreciation. Thank you, Dr. Green, and thank you, Minister. So we're delighted to have you here um, to speak with both my USSC hat on and my university hat on. I think one thing that we've learned at the university over the last two years is that the pandemic's increased our global strategic challenges and the need for robust research, policy making, and evidence-based decision making. And this is the crux of why the university exists and why we partner with the US Study Centre in this work. Our decision to move towards a more global focus over the last couple of years has been validated not only by the historic context in which we find ourselves, but by the record student numbers we're seeing in our internationally student-focused courses, including, of course, the American Studies program run by the US Study Center. Our students want to be equipped for a world in which these issues, are co these complex issues are being addressed. We, have had an, we had an ambition, interrupted by the pandemic, that 50% of our students would uh, study overseas as part of their undergraduate degree. We got to 40%, um, but I can assure you that the student recruitment team that reports to me, the very first things I signed in my new role were allowing them to travel and sign agreements, and North America was their first point of choice because that's where our students want to study. Um, I promise you this is a personal ambition, not just because of my own uh, uh, most fun uh, uh, 
semester of my undergraduate degree um, at the uh, State University of New York, um, which which uh, leaves me with a firm friend of the US. But also because this is the this is the work that our students want to do. They want to study all over the world so that they are ready for the challenges ahead. What we know is that when the university turns uh, 200 in 2050, our current students will be our national decision makers. And we want to make sure that they're ready and that they're engaged with these complex topics through the US Study Centre and the university to give them a competitive advantage and to allow them to be ready to serve our country in the future. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today and addressing all of these complex issues for us. I'll now hand over to Mark. Thanks. Thank you. Um, please um, join me in thanking the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Maurice Payne, for taking time out of her very busy schedule to come and speak with us today. I also want to thank our incoming CEO, uh, Dr Mike Green. We look forward to welcoming you um, very shortly, Mike, and uh, we're excited that you are joining us here at the centre. And also to uh, Kirsten, we thank you for your comments at the end. Um, I just want to uh, reiterate that we have invited um, the Shadow Foreign Affairs Minister Penny Wong to also uh, uh, make comments uh, if, she, if she desires. Um, I'd also like to thank um, the Senate staff who have worked to make this special event a success. Um, Interim CEO Edward Parmasano, Director of Research Projects Jared Monshine, Digital and Creative Manager Susan Beale, Media and Publications Manager Patrick Whiteley, Events Manager Janine Pinto, and Director of Communications and Stakeholder Engagement Marie Koch, uh, Marketing Outreach Officer Gopika Nair, and Research Assistant Umba Latafa. Thank you for making this event um, uh, in such a short time uh, a really successful. Thank you to the university as well for hosting us today. And uh, also thank you to my fellow board members for your support and engagement uh, with the centre. Finally, I would like to thank you all, um, both here in person, but also online, for coming and in, um, uh, joining with us today for this important speech. Um, the event will be shared on our YouTube channel, where you can also view videos of other USSC events, and we are currently uploading um, videos from the Alliance uh, dinner, which we've referred to previously, which included uh, comment speeches by the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition. We hope to see you at our next Congress, uh, our next event, the Congress, the White House and Democracy at the Crossroads, a conversation with Larry Sabato on the 10th of May at 11am. Thank you again. <laughs>